I think a lot of us were on the fence on the implementation side because it was so new. And it can be scary if you've come from a tip and ring analog world. Uh, but what we found between the Axia doc documentation that did a great job of explaining how the IP piece and networking works with Axia as well as how it works in the real world made it very easy once we understood it. And there will be a little bit of learning curve of just the change between tip and ring to IP in general. But uh, as I said before, that's something that happens now and it's going to happen in the rest of the rest of the pieces of broadcast engineering. But for people that are on the fence, I would say go ahead and make the decision because that's that it is going to happen whether you like it or not and we've really embraced it. I'm Tom Nelson. I'm the St. Paul Engineering Supervisor at Minnesota Public Radio. What we have along the wall here is we have the punch blocks that have interconnected us to, between all the studios that we've had in the legacy facilities uh, and these wrap all the way around and they're familiar. We all know them as broadcast engineers. When we put in the Axia system we had to take the existing equipment and connect it up to the Axia nodes plus we had to also connect up to some of the leg legacy equipment that was still going to be on punch blocks. And so the way we did it is we had all the nodes and we used pre-made uh, Cat5 patch cords and either brought those out directly to the pieces of equipment using XLRs or we also had to pick a couple areas where we tied back to punch blocks to be able to connect up legacy studios that at this point we weren't converting to Axia and we had to make sure stayed analog. Here's how we're connecting basically old infrastructure to new um, sources that used to come in to our old uh, SAS router uh, are now parallel into these audio nodes. Um, so that gets audio from legacy control rooms into the Axia router. So you've seen what we have in the existing facility to be able to connect up to our legacy studios. So we can now go over to the other side and look at how we're integrating with the Axia equipment. All right, we're looking at one of the wiring closets that handles the third floor news studios. And the way that we were able to configure this is we ran CAT6 cable from patch panels, just like uh, regular the way you'd run it at a business LAN, and ran those cables out into to each of the studios to be able to connect the Axia nodes into the Cisco servers that we're using uh, to handle all the audio. And below the Cisco switches, you see that we have the Axia mix engines that are all centrally located. All the fans are outside the studios and so all the equipment can be completely quiet in the studios. We're running redundant power supplies on the Cisco switches so that we uh, won't have a chance of a switch going down and causing us any failure. We were able to use vendors that normally do voice and data work to be able to do that wiring which made the installation extremely simple because that was pulled in during construction and at the same time they pulled in all the business land wiring that, they, that we needed in the new facilities. This is um, a panel, a button panel made using the panel designer and um, essentially this allows us to pick what we're feeding to the monitors in this room. So we can also heard from Dent to living there. <laughs> So you've installed a touch screen and build your own button panel with Pathfinder PC. Then. With Pathfinder PC, yeah. Okay. And it works real nicely. What are some of the panels we're looking at additionally Well, now? right now we're looking, uh, somebody is uh, selecting an air chain to move. You can see that they're, they're moving KSJN from, uh, KSJN and CMS from 41, from 441 into 4B. So, um, now all someone has to do is go into 4B, push the preset and take uh, take button, and those air chains will have moved into. What if you touched it here? Would it take it in from here? Um, yeah, we could actually uh, force a take from here. And then we're looking on the right side. Of on the right side, that's a, a virtual router, basically a subset of the, the routable sources and destinations. Uh, it just tells us which air chains are coming from which rooms. We were talking over lunch about how many sources and destinations we have. We've got something like 750 sources and 600 and some odd destinations. Uh, that's a lot to sort through if all you want to do is change what control room is feeding one air chain. Mm -hmm. So you create a virtual router, a, a subset that has just the inputs to air chains as your destinations. 
and the control rooms that you want to be able to go to air from as your sources. Uh, the biggest thing was probably just the change in mindset of you have to let go of in some ways how you did it before and the mentality that went along with that and understand the system well enough to see what it's capable of doing because as we found that there aren't that many limitations once you get it installed but there is a change in mindset both for you and talent of all of a sudden all the roadblocks that you saw before all of a sudden most of them are gone. Roadblocks like what? Um, mix minus confusions, uh, inserts, um, being able to have talk back and not have to make it a big complicated system to make talk back work back and forth. Um, audio routing, getting to, to other sites like we talked about having a STL transmitter site across the street connected by fiber. It doesn't matter, it's like it's right here in the building. Um, the hum and buzz of all of a sudden we've got an open pair or we've got a phase flop or something, all that is something in the past.